and uh, you can see all these, which are pretty exciting. And then uh, United Bank, uh, Bob Chapman, and we have uh, a new gentleman, Ray Webb, Ray Webb who is now the uh, Ann Arbor area market president. Market president. Yep. So he told me that he has lots of money to hand out, and uh, and today only there's no um, you don't have to get approval. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Dave Scaff is with him. Where's Dave? Uh, no heresy. Dave Scaff is the head of business banking, and Dave, you had the money with you, correct? I left it in the car. Oh, you left it in the car. Okay. Uh, what kind of car is it? It's a '74. And United Bank is the the bank that's going over the cliff pretty soon if, uh, if Dave keeps handing out that money. But you guys are. Uh, loaning? Your loans are picking back up, Dave? Oh, yes, big time. Okay, and uh, what's, what's the good news on that? You guys had a good year last year? We had a fantastic year, and the, the lending window is very open. So we'd love to talk to all of you. Okay, all right. So uh, if you need money, if you don't need money, whatever it is, actually, you're probably better off loaning to people who don't need money, right? It's a safer bet. Uh, and I see Jamie also is with United. So we're going to start out this morning um, very quickly going around, and I'm going to ask people, just say their name, but if you have something that you, it's like a swap shop. I don't know if you guys grew up with swap shop, but when I was growing up, uh, like in Ferndale, Michigan, it, it was the sticks then, and they had Radio Ferndale, and they would have on Saturday morning where you could trade something, you know, so yeah. you might have a uh, broken down, you know, 48 Ford, and you wanted to trade it for uh, a tractor or something like that, so this wasn't really Ferndale, Ferndale was, <laughs> it was crystal meth for some heroin, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to pass the mic and uh, just say who you are and if you have something that you want to offer or uh, show. I know we've got a couple of new businesses and I'm going to start out with those because, um, let's see, Doug Cass, where's Doug? Doug here, he's, got a, he's actually brought a little demo for us and Chuck Newman's brought a demo. So I'm going to start with you guys. Uh, Mr. Spirograph. I'm first up. Yeah, come on up. I don't, I don't think I need to Okay. Mic. I talk well, about that actually. Need for the, uh, oh, the recording. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, for the recording. Great guys, good morning. Uh, I'm Doug Cass. I'm one of the founders of a new company here in Ann Arbor called Cahoots. So no one's probably heard of that. I don't know if recently we had an article in AnnArbor.com that was kind of outlined our business plan. Um, I was one of the original founders at Giddy Up in 2002 with my partner Josh Wilkemper at the time. Some of you may know Josh. Um, in 2006 we sold that business to Elmer's Products. And in 2011, they ended up selling those assets to a couple different companies. So we had a group of people here in Ann Arbor that had a lot of capabilities in the toy industry. So we had the who part figured out before the what. So we started Cahoots about a year ago. And I'm proud to say three weeks ago, we got our first uh, supplies in, our, our product from our suppliers in China. And we started shipping the 18th of December. And we've already sold through two full containers. So it's really exciting. So those of you that, everybody's in the room is over 25, most all everybody, right? Sorry. Everybody remember Spirograph? So, what we, <laughs> so it's back. Uh, matter of fact, the Learning Express store right behind us um, supported us by putting product out on the 18th of December. And between the 18th of December and yesterday, they sold 656 units. Wow, this product. Okay. So my trade is, I'll trade you one of these for $25. <laughs> Doug, we're going to try to get you to speak at one of these events in the next series. So uh, would you pass it over to Chuck there? Sure. And, uh, Chuck's also got a new product out. It's very exciting. Uh, yes, I'm Chuck Newman, and uh, the company is Sticker It. And this is one of the incarnations of Sticker It. It's a system for preserving memories and creating a legacy. And this is an example of one of the forms of the tags that we have. We also have bags and and stickers and the like, and you attach it to a artifact that you want to pass along. And as part of the process, you create a video telling the story of the item. It is its history and significance to you and your family or to your organization, and perhaps if you wish, whether it's been appraised, by whom, when, insured, who you might want to leave it to upon your device, and this information will be stored uh, in perpetuity so whoever has that artifact will be able to see you, your story, and the story of that artifact. Very interesting. 
Jeff, how many, this is uh, one of many businesses you started in town. Lost Cow. Lost Cow. <laughs> Say the name again. Say the name, say the name of the product. STKR.IT. You will not see it on the website yet, but uh, because there's another, it's a whole range of products. This is what we can, but we, well, I can put it on the, uh, it, it, there is a website, for, uh, or there's an app, right? For, uh, I think well, I've got the app on my phone. It consists of apps, a website, uh, and physical stickers, tags, and patches. Okay. This application is not yet on the website. Okay, okay. That's pretty cool. I mean, I was thinking about my, uh, my mother-in-law who's just turned 90 and uh, she brought from Florida with her a lot of artifacts and uh, they, they, they were from her mother in Nashville that go back to like the Civil War era. So it'd be really cool. So she could, we could tape her or whatever and then when somebody looks at this pot, uh, let's say they could uh, see her actually talking about the history of it. Right, the thesis is if we don't capture these memories now, they're gonna be lost forever. And for the first time in history, really, because of the ubiquity of the internet and storage being as inexpensive, we can now leave a really nice legacy about ourselves and the people we care about that, that would be richer than virtually anybody who has ever lived prior to this. Very cool, very cool. Um, so who else has something they want to talk about? Hi, I'm Karen Rankins. I'm one of the founders of Casa Latina. It's a local Latino nonprofit that supports and promotes the full participation of Latinos in the community. One way we'd like to do that is to help organizations and businesses be able to have Spanish language services. So we do translations and interpreting. So if you do have maybe somebody coming in for a loan that needs some assistance, you can give us a call and we can work out a deal that we can help you um, interpret for that client or um, patient also sometimes in health settings. So could you give the Scott, Scott, maybe you could give us a preview of the, what's coming up this through a connection and CEO connect. Yeah, I was going to give Rob a call out. Um, because of CEO connect last month, because I was sitting right ne there next to the founder of the AM, uh, I have this month's basically coming out in 10 days cover story on the AN about higher ed and how the future of ed tech is to affect um, uh, U of M and Ann Arbor. And I hope uh, you see it and react to it and put your comments online and we can hear all about it. Yeah, uh, Say where you're located, Scott. Uh, yeah, I'm in Ross School of Business. I'm um, a faculty member there. And I, I teach online classes, shockingly enough, so I, I hope I have something to say about it. Um, um, but the other thing is, I, I, the, end, the thesis at the end is um, that there are worse places to be than Ann Arbor and <laughs> University of Michigan. Anybody else? Just pass it around to Roger. Yeah, I, that's, that's really good that, that we have people uh, documenting what the contacts they get from uh, events like this. I do a lot of networking events. I think that should be a key component of every networking event is where people can post what they've, what contacts, what, what they've gained from going to events like this. Uh, and one coming up is, uh, that everybody should know about is Annual Collaboration for Entrepreneurship, ACE 13. Uh, won't be in Ann Arbor this year, it's going to be in Livonia because we all grew Skyline. Um, there'll be a thousand uh, young companies, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, angel investors. Uh, it starts at 2 o'clock on the January uh, 31st, Thursday, and it goes to 8 o'clock. There's two sessions of so four breakout sessions each, and then a keynote speaker and awards, and, and it costs $13 to attend, cheap and you get $18 worth of food. Yeah. I saw the budget. <laughs> um, so it's definitely a good place to go and network. Uh, if you, I think they still might have some sponsor tables open, which costs a couple hundred bucks or something like that. So you can contact, you go to ace-event.org, I think it is. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, we're start, I'm Marty Bishop. I'm with the Alfred Tallman Medical Research Institute at the University of Michigan, and we're starting a series of public lectures on uh, interesting topics in the medical science field, new breakthroughs, new advances, and the first one is February 20th at the, uh, the Alfred Tallman Bi uh, Biomedical Science Research Building, and at 5.30, Max Wisha, who's the, uh, the, um, <coughs> he's the uh, director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the leading uh, exponent of the theory that cancer stem cells are what drives 
the uh, uh, the origin and growth of tumors. Uh, he is, you know, he is the leading light. My boss, Eva Feldman, says Max will be the next, per you know, the first person you have to win a Nobel Prize for this, and he should have some fascinating things to say about. He's got, I think, ten clinical trials underway uh, targeting cancer stem cells. I mean, this is going to be the future of cancer. Uh, tr cancer treatment and probably lead eventually we hope to the uh, you know the effective treatment and cure for cancer so February uh, February 20th 5 30 p.m. Uh, at the Khan auditorium in the, the BSRV hope to see you there it's free and Eva was uh, Eva Feldman uh, Marty's uh, boss was a speaker here last year she's a fabulous speaker and uh, I know you guys are doing clinical trials now and yeah, she's working on the first <coughs> stem cell treatment for ALS it's actually the first time she Stem cells have ever been injected into the human uh, spinal cord. She's done 18 procedures without any serious side effects. Uh, can't talk about efficacy, just safety now, but things look pretty good. Uh, well, Marty, if this guy wins the Nobel Prize, is that like the high school trophy? Is it anything like that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it pays more, uh, more money about, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Anybody else? <laughs> Paris? <laughs> Well, uh, I'd like to put a shout out since we're doing that uh, to really Steve. So a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, or almost a year now, uh, we were here at the CEO Connect and we were talking about a global trade mission uh, for high school students who to learn entrepreneurial skills and launch a company in a matter of three days. And just from the conversation, it kept going. And then actually it will be happening this year in Washington Community College uh, in the end of May. So. Thanks to you, Rob, and to the forum, we've been able to bring this. Not only going to touch just one person here, we're going to touch. Uh, I think so far, 62 students have signed up for this. And you can imagine the impact of the culture, the attitude, and the energy that's just going to come out of that between the businesses, the schools, and the education system. So, thanks to you. Ray, you want to say a little bit about yourself? Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Just a moment to introduce myself, Ray Webb. This is my fifth day in Ann Arbor and with United Bank. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. This is my second uh, stint in Michigan. I actually lived in Grand Rapids for 11 years and Traverse City for a couple years. And I guess what I would like to suggest is if I had business cards, I would offer them to everybody in the room because I'll have those probably next week. But the most important thing for me to do right now is to make connections so that I can... Uh, as, as I start on this uh, career path, I can uh, help Ann Arbor, the companies Ann Arbor and the folks in Ann Arbor um, as we provide solutions, as, as our brand uh, states. So I look very much forward to meeting all of you and community and business leaders in town and uh, being mutually successful. So thank you. Oh, welcome, Ray. Thanks. <laughs> and I think Ferris defined networking for us, so, so thank you for that. Uh, in addition to being a trustee of Washtenaw Community College and, and, and an old, old consultant, uh, I, we, I just became an entrepreneur. Uh, we launched uh, about a month ago a uh, web-based store called Learning to Be Great, and it's for people uh, who have tools, things that they've created, written books, uh, surveys, uh, models that they've created to help organizations improve what they're doing. Uh, this is a place where they can uh, make those tools available to others, sell those tools. And then it's a place for others uh, who need tools just in time uh, in their organizations, managers, they can come there and find what they need. So uh, pretty excited about it and it's up and running. If anybody wants to take a look at it, it's uh, learningtobegreat.com. Thanks. And the video of it. Yes. He just did a, he just did a uh, A2 New Tech. Right. five minute thing on it so and, that and Roger did a terrific video because if you can imagine in a, in a classroom what uh, what building was it Law South Hall the South, new South Hall. law building uh, law South Hall. Yeah. and um, to, to tape and get good audio and build in a room like that is just really difficult Roger did a terrific job uh, good morning, I'm Dave Gregorka. Um, among other things right now, um, I'm uh, on a part-time basis helping out the uh, Office of Tech Transfer at the University of Michigan, and it's on a, a talent transfer network grant, and uh, what it's all about is U of M is working with the six other research universities in the state 
to try to help build out their talent networks and entrepreneurs, consultants, uh, experienced business execs, and others to try to help um, get new companies launched uh, and up and rolling. So um, uh, we're looking for more connections. So it, it, uh, Western Michigan's involved, MSU, Wayne State, uh, Michigan Tech, Grand Valley, and Oakland and Wayne State. So if you have connections for universities, uh, people uh, that you can put us in touch with that might want to be part of that network to help new businesses uh, get launched, uh, give me a holler, let me know, uh, gregorka at me.com, uh, G-R-E-G-O-R-K-A at N-E.com. Thanks. Yeah, does anybody else want to... Yeah, hi, I'm excuse me, Bob Royce with the Understanding Group, and uh, Ann Arbor is the birthplace of information architecture for the World Wide Web. Information architecture is basically the discipline for structuring your website so people can find what they're looking for. And uh, my company, the Understanding Group, is a global sponsor of World IA Day, which is uh, happening in 15 locations around the world. One of them is here in Ann Arbor, and I just wanted to invite you February 9th at the Modern Language Building, and one of the auditoriums on the first floor, I don't remember which, but there's, I think we'll be the biggest event going on there, is a, a day of basically lectures on information architecture. So if you're interested in learning more about how you can uh, structure your website so people can find what they're looking for, just learn about the discipline that, that started here in Ann Arbor, come to the World IA Day, February 9th. Yeah, there you go. Um, and once your website is structured properly, you need to send people to it so that they will read the content that you provided. Um, we're, uh, my company is The Whole Brain Group. My name is Marissa Smith, and we focus on helping growing companies um, drive sales and leads online through their websites and social media and all the other stuff we're probably going to talk about today. Um, we have a class next Friday. Uh, at our office called Donuts and Inbound Marketing. Um, it used to be called Donuts and Search Marketing, but we're switching it up in 2013. Um, the new buzzword is Inbound Marketing, and that's um, a free class. I think it's at 9 o'clock. Come see me, and I'll look it up on my calendar. Um, it, in downtown Ann Arbor, and we're going to focus on how to great, create great content for your site and get people to convert from being visitors to contacts with information, or, you know, contact information, so you can keep communicating with them after that. I'm Lee Berry, I'm from Michigan Theater, and I'd like to invite everybody to come to the Michigan Theater on Thursday, January 31st, coming right up. Uh, today, actually, the Sundance Film Festival opens in Park City, Utah, runs for 10 days. At the end of the festival, 10 different directors will fly across the country with their brand new film that no one's seen before. And we're one of 10 cities that will feature a film premiere on January 31st. And uh, it's only $15. Uh, the director and several of the actors are also coming. The, the most notable is an actress named Britt Marling, who I'm not that familiar with, but a lot of people know her. You can find her on IMDb. And I hope you can make it. Thank you. How was the Golden Globes? <laughs> it was great. Well, I, I did not go. But, but it was, I was pleased to see that Argo won the best film and best director, which we've been, we showed at the Michigan is now the state, which we also programmed. I'm Suzanne Kosis with the International Institute at U of M. And um, one of the events, we're an umbrella organization for all of the area study centers for the re different regions of the world. And a big event we have coming up is on February 5th at the Michigan Union. There's a um, panel discussion about the Syrian civil war that you all might be interested in. Because that's uh, one of the many events that we put on about um, not only conflicts, but um, things going on internationally from all the regions. Um, back to the spirit of trading. Um, I'm Dane Benson. I founded a company called ExploServe, but I also serve on the board of the Ann Arbor Art Fair. Um, in an effort to help promote our artists in the fair in general, we're looking for people who have highly trafficked lobbies, banks, or theaters where we can put professional quality gallery level art temporarily in your place in exchange for PR and uh, well you get you get good art for a little while. <laughs> so if you're interested, yeah. hit me up. 
Hello, my name is Brad Labity. Um, I don't have anything to uh, uh, ask for or share. The one thing I would like to say is I had the opportunity to attend the uh, United Way luncheon, awards luncheon yesterday, and uh, uh, I would just like to take a moment to recognize the people at United Bank and Trust. It was amazing the number of individuals that were uh, represented by name and thanked for all of their hard work and dedication to the United Way campaign this year. So, Bob, to you and your team, uh, thanks to, from the community and uh, appreciate all the work. All right, I guess uh, I'm gonna, anybody else? Are we all set? Oh. Patricia, okay, go uh -huh. ahead. Patricia Garcia, I published the Ann Arbor Observer, both print and online publications. But so many of you have, <clears throat> have mentioned events related to your business and, and in the community. And I wanted to introduce a member of our staff who has never been to one of the CEO Connect meetings. But I thought it might be interesting for her and also very uh, advantageous for all of you to meet Katie Whitney, who is our calendar of events editor. And she also uh, does a lot of the work behind the scenes for our online activity as well, for our website, AnnArborObserver.com. So if you do have events, I'm taking notes, making sure they're all <laughs> on the February calendar. <laughs> so please come up and, and take an opportunity to meet Katie and, and have that connection in your, in your calendar and your information so that um, you and can continue a relationship. Read, uh, every month for... Many years. 40 years, some 35 years, a long time since we've just been. moved too. Our our office is now located over on Winewood Avenue, within walking distance of the Roadhouse. So we've spent a little, uh, a few lunches over here since our, our move in a couple months ago. Um, but we have some warehouse space to run. If you know a startup or a company that's growing and needs some warehouse space, we have about a thousand square feet to lease, and uh, it's right right nearby, close to the highway, parking space available, loading dock, so let me know about that as well. And uh, you know, I wanted to thank uh, Scott for pointing out, Ferris, to some of the connections, and I actually love it if any of you could share with, with us, me and Stephanie, uh, some of the connections you made at uh, CO Connect, because it would be kind of fun to document those. I know there's been uh, quite a bit of sharing and uh, networking and leading to business results, so uh, that's good. And maybe even friendship, which is right, more valuable than business results. Verona and I are friends, so we're going to do business together, but the friendship is a lot more fun. And, and uh, we have one other person. Uh, Marie. Oh, Marie, okay. I don't have a very loud voice, so I'll try. Um, so I'm the new executive director at the Ann Arbor Art Center, and I just want to bring up two things. We have a new education director, and she has been putting together great new children's art classes. So if any of you have children at any age up to high school, uh, check out the website because there's some really interesting classes coming up. And then secondly, after you uh, listen to STEM Cells on the 20th, on the 22nd we have a fundraising event in Ann Arbor called Artini. I don't know if anybody's ever been to that. We have 10 restaurants involved this year. And you buy some tickets to the event, and you go to the restaurants, and they all create a unique martini. It's a small shot, though. And so you taste it, and then you text your vote, and then one of the restaurants wins for the most creative artistic martini in the so, That's February 22nd, and you can get the tickets right on that. And Marie is uh, a great example of somebody who's come to Ann Arbor, uh, having worked in the Detroit area, and uh, has taken over the Ann Arbor Art Association uh, directorship and has done a great job, but it's an example, I think, of how we attract uh, great talent here, uh, not only in the for-profit area, but in the not-for-profit. So, um, yeah. We'll, we'll well, I, just, I just wanted to give a, you know, a recognition of CEO Connect, because I started uh, my consulting business two years ago, um, you know, from ground zero and came here and met a lot of people. And it was really one of the cornerstones of my, my efforts to expand my network and to gain clients. And now I haven't been here for four months because I'm so busy. So <laughs> it works. I also want to do, uh, promote, uh, I have other ways to connect. Uh, how many of you have been in uh, one of the small groups that I run? You raise, raise your hands if you've been in one of the small groups. There's quite a few people in the room. And I run small groups, which are basically monthly meetings, uh, kind of getting people together and sharing ideas, uh, sharing uh, challenges, and it's kind of a, a peer support group, I would think of it. 
So if any of you are interested, I've um, uh, got two that I'm adding some people to. One is in the IT area, uh, and the other is more of a general group where uh, people are from a variety of backgrounds. But uh, that's another way to connect. And I also do an advisory board. A number of you are participating in that where if you're a company that needs an advisory board, I've kind of got an all-star roster of people like uh, Bob Chapman and Martin Parnes and, uh, that I could draw on to create an advisory board for your company that would meet quarterly. So these are just different services that have evolved out of, out of what I've been doing as an executive coach. So um, I'm going to introduce Jerome, and uh, this is a great pleasure to introduce Jerome because he is a good friend. I've known him for many years. I think when you started, we might have interviewed me once about the, when you were the New York Times Bureau Chief, right. and he's been the Wall Street Journal reporter for um, Detroit. He has been the Bloomberg uh, Chief and uh, Free Press columnist, uh, a very, very distinguished, probably our most distinguished uh, Detroit journalist in the, in the uh, business realm. And uh, Garone is a great person. He's now taking the leap into uh, consulting and entrepreneurship, and he's uh, consulting to executives, C-level executives, about managing online uh, reputation, using uh, the IT world to try to uh, positively promote oneself and avoid some of the negatives. So uh, he's a great guy. I would uh, put him in the Hall of Mensch fame uh, because he's also a very devoted person to his family and the community and has been a, a great member of, of, of the... Uh, one of the interesting things about Ron, you may not guess, but he was in the Israeli army, correct? So uh, this is a very interesting man. I think we're all going to learn a lot from him, and it's a pleasure to have him back at, at Sioka. So everybody can take a chair. Mandy will bring coffee around, so uh, don't have to worry about grabbing it. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Daron. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Sorry. 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 Palestinian movement and a lot of activity for the Palestinian movement in Ann Arbor and I always feel like if I get that played out too much I might get ridden out of town on a rail but we only lean blue. <laughs> exactly. So um, I, I, don't, I don't play that up too much but I, I, I will say that um, I just came back from Israel. I was in Israel right at the end of November and uh, as fortune would have it, I was there during the time when there were missiles being fired from Gaza into Israel and uh, had a chance to see the operation of the Iron Dome missile system. Does anybody know what the Iron Dome missile system is here? Um, you should pay more attention to it because it's going to be a, a game changer in terms of military strategy. Um, very interesting technology. Um, I, I, I do love coming to Ann Arbor and I love the fact that Ann Arbor is here because I'm based in Detroit now and have been really most of my career 
uh, the reason I, I've basically ended up spending my, most of my journalistic career in Detroit is because I'm a business and financial journalist. I was transferred here to cover the automobile industry for the Wall Street Journal. And so I've been going down the Lodge Freeway now for 30 years, almost 30 years, and uh, had, a, had a chance to see Detroit really at its lowest. And now am based in Detroit um, and have been very fortunate to participate in the kind of rise and rebirth of Detroit, which is extremely exciting. So I think of Detroit as a world of commerce and transactions. I think of Ann Arbor as a world of ideas and learning and creativity. Um, and it really gives such a nice balance to this, this part of the world. It's so easy to get in a car in the morning as I do and be downtown in uh, Detroit or be in Ann Arbor. And it's, um, it, it, it's a nice thing to have. Um, Rob was very kind to invite me today to speak to you, and uh, I thought the mic just a little bit. Sure, sorry. Um, I I decided that um, it would be perhaps um, beneficial to talk a little bit about how media has changed and what media is changing into, um, drawing from personal experience. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I, I started here with the Wall Street Journal, which is kind of a leading, uh, a, a leading organ of, the, of what we would call the mass media. Um, I, I was there for a, several years. Then uh, I left to write a book. Um, and the publishing world, again, falls into the category of mass media. I returned, went to work for the Wall Street Journal, for the, for the New York Times, another piece of the mass media, uh, then Detroit Free Press, Bloomberg, so forth. Um, uh, again, mass media. Now I'm, I'm running for Fortune, uh, mostly their digital product, which is called Fortune.com, which is a kind of a collaboration of CNN and Money and Fortune, uh, part of the Time Empire, another member of the uh, mass media. I, I wonder um, how many of you ever read the book, or are familiar with the book, um, The Powers That Be by David Halberstam, which was written in 1980. Anybody know that book? Thank you. Um, David Halberstam is probably one of the dozen or so most distinguished journalists of, uh, of uh, my generation. He wrote uh, The Best of the Brightest. He wrote um, uh, The Reckoning about Detroit. But he, he really sort of was a, he was a New York Times bureau chief, but he was really a breakout author, I think, because of this book, The Best of the, uh, the Powers That Be. And The Powers That Be in 1980 was a book that really surveyed um, the New York Times, um, CBS, the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, and Time Magazine, and really wrote about the, the sort of outsized influence of power they had in the framing of, of policy, in the um, in the operations of government, in the um, shaping of uh, taste and culture in the United States, and uh, I, I I don't know how many different prizes this book won, but it's really kind of worth reading today for understanding what you all understand, which how much the world has changed since then. Um, it's become apparent, really, I would say, in the last half dozen years, um, that everything about the mass media is in the process of going away uh, and being changed into something else. And this is because of digital technology. It's a change, of course, that's as every bit as profound as the uh, movement a century ago from horse-drawn transportation to motor-propelled uh, transportation. And, uh, I think we've probably only seen the very beginnings of it, and it's something that's going to obviously influence uh, not just communication, but business, art, religion, science, technology, just everything there is. And you were taking names before. I saw you scribbling on a piece of paper. I still scribble on pieces of paper. I'm uh, on my phone. No, right. <laughs> um, and any of you just ask any of your uh, any of your children, nephews, nieces, cousins under the age of 40 how many paper bound pu paper publications they subscribe to, and you're going to find out where we're going to be in 20 years. And, and the answer in most cases is zero. Um, 
I, um, I only subscribe to one paper publication. I used to get a ton of them, and it was kind of an issue in our house, just kind of throwing paper away every day. Uh, but um, I now get Sports Illustrated, and because of something that happened this week, I, I may stop that one. Um, does anybody know what I'm talking about? What am I talking about? I'm talking about a fake Twitter person. Is the name Manti Tio mean yeah. I'm, I'm glad it does because uh, it really kind of provided me a, uh, a great touchstone to talk about what I wanted to talk about this morning, which is the kind of movement from paper to digital and what that really affords a CEO as an opportunity to, to communicate, to find audiences, to shape reputation. You know, this, uh, this Manti Teo, uh, I have to confess, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. I guess there was some attention paid to Notre Dame here in Ann Arbor, particularly because of the loss of the, to the team this year, and also the kind of huge insult of saying, hey, we don't want to play, uh, we don't want to play Michigan anymore, we're too big for Michigan or too good for Michigan or something else uh, like that. And then suddenly we find out that this guy had been maintaining uh, this, uh, this false romance online. Um, I think that it's going to. I think that it's going to. Uh, this is this is a story that that, that is definitely viral in the sense that uh, everybody has an opinion. It's captured everybody's imagination immediately. Everybody's got an opinion. Um, I was struck when I two nights ago, the night before last, when I started when I first started focusing on it, I think it, broke in, I think it broke Wednesday afternoon. It seems like it was a month ago already, but it broke Wednesday afternoon. And uh, I'm going to various news sources, and I decided to read the New York Times story, which I did. And then I, I read the comments, and there were about, you know, within an hour or two, there were 200 comments. I don't know how many of you read the New York Times online. Uh, I, I do intermittently along with all the other things, but I, I don't touch the paper product because the paper product doesn't come with comments. And the comments to me are as interesting, if not more interesting, than, than the story itself. And it's very obvious that many of the people who are writing the comments are much more perceptive than the reporters. And I think this is part of, the, this is part of what is changing media is not just the the lack of, a, of an economic imperative to to um, be able to sell things on paper and physically deliver them, but the, the lack of interactivity uh, is, is what is going to kill media that doesn't understand that that's become a sort of a fundamental part of, of why people embrace digital media is because of interactivity. So whenever I'm talking to somebody who's coming up with some in, some digital product, um, I, I use this example of the New York Times and its comments because I feel like anybody who is starting something online who doesn't make it interactive is really missing a, a, a great opportunity for engaging and binding yourself to your audience. It's a little bit more complicated, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's, it's definitely something that's worthwhile. Anyway, so, so Manti Chia, what, you know, you can talk about this story in terms of what it means about sports and what it means about celebrity and, 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 and what it means about deception and sort of all the human dimensions of it. To me, it, it the thing that sort of came to me right away was how many of the mass media had been completely taken in by this. I mean, completely. And who, it, what media outlet it really was that uncovered it? Does anybody know the name of the media outlet that uncovered it? Deadspin. Deadspin. Really? Deadspin? You're kidding, right? So the New York Times, the Washington Post. AP, everybody gets taken in, but not only taken in, but perpetuates, inflates, carries, uh, celebrates, publicizes, and Deadspin says, hey, wait a minute, what are the facts here? And they were, to, to me, this is remarkable. To me, this is just, this, this just sort of says everything about the state of media today, and is sort of more evidence of what I've 
what I believe to be true, which is that the mass media is on the way out, that you're going to see several of these large organizations fail utterly in the, in the future. Um, the ones that survive will survive only because they figured out what they need to figure out about migration to, the, um, to, to, a, to some kind of digital presence and the day of sort of physically delivering things to people on paper, you know, except for maybe menus and restaurants. So, um, when I when I kind of figured that out or decided that that was my hypothesis, let's say two and a half years ago, um, I uh, I took a a um, an assignment to continue to cover the automobile industry for Fortune.com because this was um, a subject a, a piece of subject matter that I had already devoted 25 to 30 years. Um, I had you know know a million people and a lot of more about the subject than a really probably a normal person probably would need to, and uh, uh, decided to keep covering that, which I do. But I um, I decided I was really going to just restrict that in terms of my own career planning to about a fifth of what I do. So a fifth of what I do is writing occasional stories for the Wall for for Fortune, and then the other. 80% is, is working, as uh, Rob mentioned to you, with um, CEOs and projects in various stripes, trying to gain uh, more ability, more knowledge, uh, more facility with um, digital. Uh, so the, the first person I started working with in this is a guy named Pete Carmanos, who is the CEO of CompuWare, and is a person who um, founded a company back in 1973 that was basically in the computer business uh, in a world of mainframes. There were no PCs, there were no minis, there were no, um, obviously, uh, no smartphones, um, but, but he was interested in technology. And uh, he decided about three years ago that um, his company really kind of needed to get a bit of a boost with um, digital technology because it's still very much of the revenue of copyware is still tied to mainframes which are still very very important in the computer world um, so he brought me in to talk a lot about how he might do that one of the things that he thought he was going to do was to blog he said you know he had read a lot about blogging he said you know come you know help help me get involved in this help me do this so uh, we started you know just basically from zero you know sitting at the table saying okay so what is it you really want to say? And what we figured out after uh, many meetings and working, many, many uh, uh, discussions about this is uh, the following. Um, there's a big opportunity for a CEO, any CEO, to find an audience through social media. Um, they're able through um, figuring out where the, where the clusters in your subject area are to become a, um, thought leader in whatever it is that you're going to be a thought leader in. Whatever aspect or dimension of your business um, really lends itself to your authority. Um, but, it, but the truth is that if you're a CEO and you're not a journalist, you're going to find it very difficult to write about something on a, on a continual, permanent basis because journalists are trained really to come in, write, report, go home, come back the next day, write, report, go home, do the same thing again and again and again. I'm sure Marty can tell you, or you know, I know Marty from uh, my days at the Free Press when he was at the, at the competitive paper of the news. But this is what this is what journalists do. This is not what CEOs do. And it's very, very difficult for a CEO to to do that. You have to be really unusual. And if you don't do it on a continual basis, uh, you might as well not because it's it's uh, to write intermittently and to post intermittently and to participate intermittently is to continually start from zero, wait a while, and start from zero again, and you'll find it very frustrating and hard to get any momentum. You, you really need to start and to continue and to continue and to continue and to continue, and it's and it's. Um, Something that most CEOs, most non-journalists, never mind CEOs, all non-journalists are not really prone to be able to do. So, one of the things I recommend to, to CEOs is 
don't get involved in something that you're not really willing to persevere at because it's really just a waste of time and you're probably not going to be able to do it without the collaboration of someone who is a writer. Either someone who is a journalist or someone who is able to already has that ability to kind of work with you every day on editing and ideas. Um, so, uh, so Pete's, I, I went to, I, I'm doing other things at CompuWare, other things in social media. Pete is, um, I would say, participating intermittently in, in, in selected um, subjects that he cares about, immigration, um, he's been very involved, he's a sports franchise owner of the, of the Carolina Hurricanes, so he's been involved in the NHL uh, strike, but, but, but he realizes, and probably a little too late for his own career, he's about to retire, that um, a CEO really has an opportunity that didn't exist in the world of, of mass media. And that is, um, when I was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, I had a number of companies that I was responsible for. And those companies were always trying to entice me. You know, guys like Larry Eiler would call me up and say, hey, you should come up with a story about this or that. And sometimes I would, and sometimes it didn't really fit with what our coverage was. But basically, the company and the CEO was, had to wait before the member of the mass media truck decided that they were going to come and cover it. Those days are over. If the CEO now decides that they want to take an initiative for some kind of news story or some kind of technology development or some kind of uh, uh, publication of, of, a, uh, of an aspect of thought leadership that's new, different, important, they can do that on digital. And so uh, this is really a kind of a reversal in a way of the, of the, uh, of the leverage that uh, was really once held by the mass media and is now very much held by the CEO. And this is important that you realize that you have this opportunity and you have this, this leverage. Um, I would say that what it's done, and we're getting back, getting back to Manti, the Manti Teo story, is that it's really brought a lot of people quickly into journalism who are not vetted to be doing the things and writing the stories that they should be vetted to write. Um, part of the reason why the, uh, I believe that the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and others were taken in on this story, and will be taken in on other stories, is um, the fact that people at the top have left. There's not much editing of the mass media as part of this sort of destructive process as it unfolds, but, but the kinds of editors who would have questioned a story like the Manti Teo story and said to a reporter who brought that in, hey, go look at this death certificate. You know, we, I, and, I, and I've been in situations like that where, where we come in to a city editor or to a metropolitan editor and say, hey, we've got this really cool story. The editor looks at it and says, did you see the death certificate? Did you read the lawsuit? Did you actually go and down to the courthouse and look at the lawsuit and read it? And you didn't, so go do it. Sometimes, uh, you know, I, when I, I, I attended Columbia and I had a very tough journalism professor who used to say the following to us, and I've never forgotten this. Never, never look too deeply into a good story. <laughs> what was this guy talking about? <laughs> never look too deeply into a good story. Well, what he was really saying is, look deeply into every good story because most of the good stories are not exactly as they're presented. You, know, you have to remember that the mass media, you know, if you sell whatever you sell, the mass media is selling stories. And what's nice about interactivity, what's nice about being able to have comments online, is that people who actually know something about this subject can respond. Um, I realized very early in my career that the credibility of, of newspapers was actually fairly low in the community. I mean, they had a monopoly, really, for advertising, and they had a monopoly for reporting. But the credibility was kind of low, and, and the, you find this out when you would talk to somebody who would say, and I've heard this a hundred times, you know, it's interesting, I love the newspaper. I, there's all kinds of stories in it, but whenever they write something about something I know something about, it's always wrong. 
that's interesting. Okay, so the 99% of the stores you don't know anything about, you're prepared to accept. The 1% you do know something about, you reject. After I hear that a hundred times, I say, hmm, you know, what does that tell me about what the probability of credibility of, of the whole newspaper? Not very high. And that's, you know, that's consistent with all the surveys we know about the credibility of the daily newspaper. So we're going into this, this, this new world, and uh, I'm <coughs> redefining myself as a, uh, a journalist in order to do that. And when, like I say, when I started out, my dream, of course, was to work for the New York Times. I didn't know why it was my dream. It was just everybody said, you know, I read, I've been reading the New York Times since I was 10 years old, and it was my dream to work for the New York Times. Um, I think my dream has really changed now, and having worked for the New York Times, I'm very glad I did it. I'm very glad I'm not there anymore. But I, I kind of have a new dream, and that's to sort of, as long as I can stay in this profession, to be in the vanguard of whatever it is that's happened to make it profound and relevant to people who use digital and people who want to hear stories and people who want to learn about what's happening in the community. Let me give you one example of what I mean. Um, being, because of this association with Compu, where I quickly found myself again in downtown Detroit, but not because I needed to be close to General Motors and Ford and other, other um, parts of the automobile industry, but because Compuware's headquarters are in Campus Marshes. Now Pete was really a conversation changer for downtown Detroit because when he brought Compuware, built the Compuware building down there in, uh, in 2003 and opened it, it was really a conversation changer. He's really the guy who probably is responsible for the development of Campus Marshes. I, have, you, have you been down there and seen what's going on? And, and, and then he was the person really that helped bring Dan Gilbert downtown. Now Gilbert's bringing young people downtown, buying buildings, buying casinos, you know, building rail lines, this, that, the other. And uh, and I, I, I'm sure that, that the momentum is established and that Detroit is going to rise again. It's not going to be the Detroit that it was and shouldn't be the Detroit that it was, but it's going to be something significant and powerful and profound again. But um, being part of that is very exciting, personally, because nobody likes to see the death of an American city. Um, anyone would be excited and, and stimulated by the rebirth of an American city. But there's a, um, so I got interested in um, um, urban farming. Uh, there was a, one of the things we did in a, on, a, on an empty lot was to uh, put a garden in. And it, there was no building there, but it had become sort of an abandoned lot between where the book Cadillac is and where the where the courthouse is. So we had to convince the city to let us put a garden in there. And it was just, you know, we basically said, look, we'll, we'll build this thing. We'll take care of it. It's your land. If you want it back, you can have it whenever you want it. We'll be off of there in, you know, 48 hours. Um, it was very hard to get the city council to let us do that. So I helped them with the communications effort. Now this is was, this is more like a public a public relations thing, but the way we handled it is to create a digital presence, to get people to write about it, to kind of interact with some of the gardening groups around town, to talk about and link to um, sources and, and, and special and sources and and places of interest that knew about growing things inside cities and helping to give the, the, um, the efforts some shape and some credibility. Um, and it was successful, and they finally let us build it, and we build it, and we've done that. It's, you know, it's been a kind of a, a very nice thing for the neighborhood. Um, the next thing that happened is that it attracted the attention of a guy named John Hans. I don't know if any of you know this guy Hans, but he has a big financial services place in, in Southfield. Um, he's an entrepreneur, and he believes that for-profit farming in Detroit can be a great economic development magnet that, that it can provide jobs, that it can put land back on the, on the um, tax rolls, that um, it can bring interest from around the world, from other places that will want to see how urban farming works out in, Amer in a major American city. That just, there's so many things, potential goods to this, and so little downside that it's something that he would like to pursue. Um, 
And so uh, I'm interested in this as well. And we're in the very early. I'm, I think I think that I'm in the very early stages of trying to get a coalition together of academics, entrepreneurs. Um, specialists in agronomy, perhaps some corporations that want to try hydroponics, uh, maybe reclaim some of the abandoned buildings for growing, some of the people, um, some of the, some of the um, futurists who say that the city of the future are actually going to grow their own food, it's not going to be trucked in from, from afar, it's actually going to be grown within the city. Really interesting ideas. Um, so I find myself in the middle of kind of thinking that through helping people to write about it, um, thinking about the kind of messaging. What does it mean when you, when you message? Well, I think of that as writing a headline. You know, every, every time I would come back to the office with a story, a really good editor would say, okay, what would the headline on that story say? And then it would go down. You know, how would you condense that thought into 10 words or less? Um, it forces you to really think about what is the essence of what it is you're trying to do? What is the essence of what you're trying to say? And uh, you know that's obviously an important thing for anyone who wants to send a message to the outside world about who you are, what you are, what you're selling, what you'd like to sell, what you'd like to develop. Um, and um, that's kind of in a nutshell what um, what my practice has been about and what I've been doing. And um, I, I, if I have any regrets at all about my own career, it's probably I didn't start doing this sooner because uh, I found myself, you know, well into my Bloomberg career writing monthly sales stories and quarterly earnings stories and realizing that I had done this, you know, not 10 or 15, but 20, 30, 50, 80, 200 times. It wasn't that interesting. What I'm doing right now is, I guess, this new form of journalism in a sense. Um, I, I, I don't know whether it will exist in this form 10 years from now. It does exist today. Um, it is very helpful to CEOs, and I'd like very much if uh, any of you want to respond to what I've said or ask me questions or rebut, contradict, um, add to, you know, this, this is really your chance to do it. I'd like to kind of moderate that discussion. I'm interested in what you think, I'm interested in what you think about uh, people who don't, use, don't sign their names. On, on different interactive communications. And lots of publications don't want you to. You can put any name you want. Lots of publications do. Um, and so I think it's a more germane conversation if you sign your name, but a lot of people don't agree with you. Um, the whole question of moderation of comments is a very rich and expanding topic. And there really isn't any right answer to it. There are places that say, there are places that post warnings say, keep it civil, you don't have to write your, your, your um, name, but we're going to take you off if you're uncivil. There are other places that say, we want your email address, you can put some, some screen name if you want to, but we, you have to be a real person. Um, there are other places that say, we want your name, we want your email address. If you don't want to do that, go someplace else and make a comment. So there are, and, and by the way, there, there are a dozen more gradations of that. Um, there are also evolving programs that allow people to vote and to put you know, relevance and comments that people find interesting and important and civil to the top and all the rest of the stuff down at the bottom. Um, I'm fascinated by this because, it, to, to me, this is um, in profound uh, contradiction to the old letters to the editor column, which was, you know, we'll, 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 pr we'll print something, and oh, by the way, it'll probably be a message that tells us how great we are for, for publishing that story in the first place. Um, you know, newspapers were famously um, unwilling to be interactive with their with their audiences, and that's why the Jason Blair scandal happened at New York Times. And that's why things like the Janet Cook scandal happened at the Washington Post, because, because papers didn't really have a good feel for who their readers were and what they thought about what they were writing. So this whole area of moderation of comments is an evolving area. I'm sure it's going to continue to change. I'm sure you know 10 years from now it won't look anything like it, it is, but I suspect what's going to happen is that there'll be a It'll be more useful. 
In other words, it's evolving in a way that's going to be more useful to the reader. There'll be there'll still be lots of comments, I think, but but, you, but they'll be they'll be arrayed and arranged in a way that'll be more useful to you. Can you hold just a second? We have to change tapes. Sorry. I want to get all the questions on the tape too. <laughs> He's changing the team, so um, this is old school. Can you get Do you want a hashtag? I don't have a hashtag. You see I've been like, you see CEO Connect. Yes, I do. Maybe starting today does. And we're back. I always afraid of hashtags because I'm still worried about getting arrested for those. Does anybody, does everybody in the room know what a hashtag is? No. Um, the question I have is. Uh, oh, yeah, we have one up here. Go ahead. You speak into the mic. Uh, the question I have is that, you know, as you create content, as Pete, you create content, how can be found? I think that the the, uh, the search engines have become so cultivated and uh, move towards their advertisers that, you know, if you look up something now, you never find a research study. You find something you can sell you something. And, uh, so that's how Google makes money. That's how Google makes money. And so how do you, so how do you avoid that? How do you I, I wonder if there's someone else who has an answer to that question. Because... Yeah. Is that what you yeah. Um, what, what we typically tell people is that you really need to cultivate a community of people who care about what you do, and you do that through social media, connecting with people who are talking about the topics that you're talking about um, and they're interested in, and also building an email list, honestly. Um, you can get people to subscribe to your blog. When they do, they give you their email address, and then after they do that, then you have a way of contacting them and communicating with them. Use your LinkedIn contacts, use groups in LinkedIn, you know, any professional associations, all things like that to build a community of people who are all interested in the same topics. And then you, you share your content with them and ask them to circulate it for you as well. And that's how you build your community and get that traffic then going back to your website as well. It's, it's complicated, <laughs> but it is possible to do. Yeah, and, and it's time consuming. I mean, I we have an auto writers page on Facebook, which I, I think has just come into existence probably in the last three months. And so everybody like me who writes about the automobile industry is contributing content to that. And so we build sort of this little community where we share ideas about, you know, what used to be sort of a whole session of five or ten writers over coffee or a drink somewhere ends up being a conversation on Facebook about you know, the Audi press conference or, or something that something that GM has just done or something that the, the chairman of Ford has just said. Um, and, and by participating and, and being being facile on Facebook, I mean, Facebook is so easy to dismiss, but it's so also so important. And so by being on, facile on Facebook, you become more able in whatever area it is that you're interested in and more aware of stuff so that you're not cluttered. I don't get cluttered with uh, you know offers to you know 500 off to buy a Silverado truck when I want to hear about something about the Silverado and, and you know the design of the Silverado and what's important about it I'm dealing about that through the auto riders so I'm not really bombarded with all the advertising messaging from the from General Motors so that's yeah so my question um it's more, it's not a question as much. Um, about five or six years ago, I helped a local nonprofit develop their online social media internal policies. And I think that for business leaders, it's really important that you have a policy of comment moderation, but also how do you respond to interactions? If somebody is tweeting you and they're really mad about your service or something, that can go a lot farther than if somebody's just happy, they have to be really happy to tweet about you. So it's very easy to piss people off. It's harder to make them happy enough to tweet about you. Um, it's worked for me. I complained about not getting good Verizon service. Verizon called me, they gave me 20 bucks off my bill. Easy. You know, that made me happy. So then I did tweet about them. But um, you need to make sure you do have some kind of policy about re responding to people's complaints, especially as soon as you can. 
Yeah, I mean, this this could be sim as simple as you know, at your bank, identifying somebody whose job it is every morning to go through the hashtags that apply to your bank and see everybody that said everything and make a report. And uh, I mean, what greater tools of self-identification of problems before they become disasters is there than social media? I mean, the, 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 wow. the corporate world is all over this stuff. And, and the horizons of the world have figured out very, very quickly what to do with it. Jamie's uh, been through both worlds of the advertising and now the new world. I wonder if you could comment on some of the changes sure. from your perspective, Jamie. You say what your, your role is. So I'm the marketing director at United Bank and Trust, and, and I will say that we're sort of new into the social media space, but from the beginning we started with a policy. So before we ever started our Facebook site or went on LinkedIn, we spent a lot of time internally developing our policy. And we do um, we do, do Google alerts and, and lots of interactive alerts so that we're calling that information on a daily basis. And, and we like hearing sort of the bad information because that allows us to respond. Um, but you, it does take a lot of human resource time. So you can't sort of jump into it and, and then walk away. you got to be dedicated to it. Well, Patricia, well, how, how things, maybe you can comment from the observer's point of view with some of the changes. I, I, um, there's so many wonderful changes in terms of, of print to digital media. But one of the biggest concerns, of course, for a publisher is how do you monetize? And, and in addition to that, the monetization issue is the question of trust and what's happening to the industry of investigative journalism and the issue of trust in what you read online. And we've tried diligently to fact check and make sure that what we publish is accurate. But when you're looking at any number of sources online, how do you know? Even with commentary, um, it's very difficult to assess accuracy. So can you address the whole issue of investigative journalism and, and what's happening in terms of trust? Well, first first of all, let's talk about monetization. Um, and the, newspaper, the newspaper industry was built on um, display advertising, uh, classified advertising, uh, real estate in, in, in huge categories like help wanted and and and, um, and real estate and of course that's been disintermediated by monster and you know yeah. successor uh, digital ventures that have that have actually disintermediated monster um, the real estate industry got its act together real quickly and figured out it needed a digital several digital platforms to kind of manage the change in real estate and uh, you know my wife who always loves to look for new houses I mean she's all over this stuff if you've ever seen Trulia if you've ever seen Zillow if you've ever seen any of these things you, you understand why newspapers are never going to have a chance to have those categories again so if you're a news organization um, and you define yourself as let's say local news you have to think about okay so what is it I'm really doing um, and how do I how do I become um, a, a, a an organization and an entity that's providing value for which I can collect money for? Now um, I know that this town was kind of this town was <laughs> profoundly wounded when the, the Ann Arbor news went away, and people were very very angry, and so now Ann Arbor.com has come up, and and you know sort of the most common. Uh, comment I hear about it is, oh well, it's not the Ann Arbor News. Well, get over it. It's not the Ann Arbor News, and it's not going to be the Ann Arbor News. But it's trying to be something else, and um, if it's going to survive, it's going to need some kind of way to monetize itself. So um, I'm paying attention to this, uh, and I'm paying attention to the things that they're doing. I think with groceries. I think that they. I think if, uh, does anybody is anybody using the there's a there's a kind of a digital space within Ann Arbor.com that has to do with groceries and what's on sale and so forth. And they're trying to develop this, and I'm paying attention to it because I'm involved with a digital venture downtown that's part owned by CompuWare called Deadline Detroit. And Deadline Detroit is going to have the same problem. It's a startup, but eventually if it wants to grow, it's got to figure out how to connect with, with downtown merchants. Now, now I think that um, one of the ideas that should have been that should have been 
ideally would have been an idea of the of the news organization business was Groupon. Groupon started as kind of a half off type um, um, site where you could where you could where you, it was basically a deal site. And so now the the, uh, the newspapers have got deal chicken and some other things that are sort of copies of Groupon, but basically. What they did was they were coming with a new proposition to the local merchants using their technology, which is, okay, if people come to us, and by virtue of coming to us, they can get a discount on their, on their purchase, um, then, then um, maybe they'll also see the other things that we do and be interested in them. Um, this is in the sort of, I would call, the early tinkering stage, and it's, and it's not uncomplicated, and it's not inexpensive, but, but it's, it's, it has to happen if, if organizations like yours are going to survive and prosper into the future, you have to figure out a way to pay for it. Now, in terms of journalism, um, I just think that sites, I, I don't think that there's any way for um, news organizations to endure into the future other than to do good work and to keep doing good work, and by that, develop a reputation for doing good work and, and, and being sort of in front of the ones that have, you know, make big mistakes, miss things, just aren't good at what they are, because people have a limited amount of time. And if they want to know sort of, you know, what, where the, where the, how, to, how to take in the Ann Arbor Art Fair, they're going to decide where to go, and whoever does the best job of presenting that to the to the public is the one that's going to endure. So, I mean, this is—I don't envy people who are in your business, really, or in my business, because it's just it's it's total reinvention that requires constant attention to what succeeds and what fails. Uh, but but I but I hope, for instance, that AnnArbor.com really sort of survives and flourishes into something that, that um, will serve the community as well as the Ann Arbor News did in its day. I, I, don't, I don't think that's probably a very good answer for you. You probably wanted a simpler answer than that. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm, this is my first time here. I'm Tilly Shamas. I'm the Executive Director at Halal at the University of Michigan, and uh, that services Jewish students on campus. I have a quick comment about moderation, and um, our Facebook group is specifically designed for students. And I think because we spent a lot of time thinking about the goals that we were using for the Facebook group, it, allows, it allowed us to be very clear in terms of our moderation. And so it is a platform designed um, for us to communicate with students, students to communicate with us, students to communicate with one another. So when there are external providers that are advertising on our site, we are on our posting on our Facebook wall, um, it's very easy for us to moderate that and to eliminate that and to put a very clear statement. Now, if a student wants to promote one of these external groups, then that would be another story, and, and we could have conversations about that. But because we were so clearly defined of what kind of community we wanted to create on that Facebook group, it allowed us to um, be very clear about our moderation. So it leads me to my question about um, within our organization, we have certainly our, our silo of those who work in programming and then another silo of those who work in development. And they have very different needs in terms of social media. One, of creating community on campus, and the other, of interacting with our donor community. And I hear from, from um, in particular now, our development team, we have to get on LinkedIn, we have to get on Pinterest, we have to do, but without strategy around it in terms of, so I'm curious uh, about your recommendations or anybody else uh, uh, to continue the conversation, how do you manage the competing interests of your target groups and your audiences? And what are the kinds of questions you ask um, when dealing with different styles of social media and how to use them to further your goals? Well, I mean, first, first of all, it sounds, it sounds to me like the programming group and the development group probably need their own platforms. They have really have different audiences, so you have to kind of recognize that going in. And, and again, hypothetically, I would say, you know, if I was in this discussion, I would say you probably have to start thinking about, first of all, separating them so they each have their own platforms to develop their own specific audiences. You know, obviously linked to one another. There are certain goals and, and ideas that link them together, 
and, and those are those are those are important and you should be able to reach obviously one to another and there will be sort of cross shopping when you're when you're when you're going out to raise money you're also letting people know about events and when you're you know telling them about events you're also letting them know that we welcome your donations but in terms of sort of the power of developing lists and audiences the real audience of donors is probably different than the, than the program users of Hillel on, on, on campus. So, you, you know, the, again, this makes it more complicated, more difficult, more work, more expense, more everything. But, but I think you really have, you have, to, you have to bifurcate these things because it becomes very confused. And, and you know, in some ways, this is, it sounds like it's already happening. Just don't stop it. Let it go, you know, let it go. Let, let it move in that direction, I would say. I just have a quick question. You you mentioned that if the CEO is gonna tweet or I guess be active in the blog world or social media, that intermittent is bad. That you should not do it if you're, yeah, if you're only gonna do it occasionally. So how often I wouldn't say it's bad, I would just say for it, to, for it to be effective, it has to it has to have secrecy. Yeah. So weekly, monthly, daily? Um, I don't think there's any formula, but usually monthly is is uh, that's not enough. I mean, it's it's got to be, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, you know, three times a week, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be long. You know, when we used to think about a big story we work on, we think about something with 700 words, 1,200 words, 1,500 words. You have something to say in 250 words, put it out there. You know, it doesn't doesn't need a big wind up. It doesn't need a lot of elaboration. It may be a, a short thought. I mean, Rob's great at this stuff. Just just put it out there. I mean, I would rather see three pieces a week of 200 words than one one piece a week of 750 words. So, so it's really, it's really about repetition. It's about, it's about being prolific. It's not necessarily about being as long as, as you can make it, and as you know, as well. I just wanted to cut in because many of you get uh, Dr. Rob on Monday, which I've been doing for a couple of years, and it's it's pretty interesting because I've written several books. Uh, but one of the biggest problems with writing a book is um, writer's block. You know how hard it is to get started. And the nice thing about writing regularly is that I've got to put something out on Mondays. And you know, I've got a book now, uh, two books probably, that I could put out with those, if it's worthwhile. I don't even know because people are buying the books, but it is good for you that want to write, I think, to, to commit yourself to doing it because like anything else, you practice, you get better and better at it. And uh, I've, I've coached a lot of people, I can look around the room and see, smile at a few people who, who I've encouraged to get their ideas out. And by creating something like that, a, a weekly post or whatever, and committing to it, you're going to force yourself to write. Steve, you, you blog, right? How often do you blog? Once a week. Once a week. And, uh, and you know, it's created a, a couple of years you've been doing that, so you've got quite a bit of material. And this is, you know, listen to Steve Gill talk about whatever, and uh, he's uh, provided a great service on, I think yours is on leadership, is that correct? Uh, leadership management, organizational learning. Okay. So, you know, I think that uh, there's another aspect of it in terms of what it could do for us as, as, as creating and expressing ourselves. Uh, that is, you know, whether it, it benefits mankind or not, it's, it's a good thing to, uh, to write. And I, I'm happy to see so many people these days writing that never did that before. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, and, and that is that the the CEO, you have to think of yourself as a brand, okay? You have to think of yourself as a brand distinct from the organization you run. And sometimes it's a very smart strategy to blog about subject and about things that you feel passionately about that may connect peripherally to your business but not be strictly your business because a person if you're selling widgets every day I don't want I don't want a daily message from you about why your widget is the best widget the you know the cheapest widget whatever it is but but if if you can tell me something 
about yourself and your view of the world, which actually does relate perhaps peripherally to your business, I might be more inclined to be interested in your business. So it's so I would say again, it's important to recognize that the CEO brand is very important and is different than the brand of your company. Um, and, and to the question of how often, um, does anybody know who Seth Godin is? I get blogs for Seth Godin at least every day and sometimes twice a day. And I don't read them all. But whenever I do read them, I like them. So how do you get, how do you get your blog? What, how does it I subscribe to Seth Godin's blog and it comes in an email form. So I can go to his blog site if I want to. If I don't want to get anything, if I don't want to clog my email, I can go to his blog site and get it. Yeah. Or he can send it to me. You can do the same thing. As you collect, you said before, as you collect email addresses, <laughs> you can ask people to opt in. And when you when you blog, you send them a blog. If they want to get it every day, great. If they don't want to get it, write a better blog. Maybe they'll maybe they will want to get it. I mean work on it. Get better, get shorter, get smarter. You know, give, give more value, just like you do in your businesses. Do do what you do better, and you'll. You get I have a question about thought leaders, and that is, uh, there's a lot of people in this room, like Scott is an example, Marvin, that know a lot um, about certain subjects. Besides the writing, what what is needed to create oneself as a thought leader? What are the different ways, the, the building blocks of that? Well, I, I think you know, for any writer, and you're going to hear this from any editor. Write about what you know. You know, whatever, whether it's the guitar, whether it's vacation spots, whether it's you know a, a deep and abiding love for you know Elizabethan poetry. Even if you're even if you're selling even if you're selling guitars, but you're reading Elizabethan poetry, look for the connections, the artistic connections, the intellectual connections. You know, draw people into your world. Um, succeed as a writer that way by drawing people into your world. That's what we. That's what writers. You know. That's what we work at every day. That's what, uh, you know. It's it's is it is it hard? Sure, it's hard. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it. But but the fact is that if you're already a CEO, if you're already a person of accomplishment and thought, chances are very good. That if you're willing to devote the time to think about how to make your writing and your thinking compelling to your audiences, that you can you can find a way to do that. What about other media like uh, Rogers doing it? A lot of video. How important the other media works together? Um, video, everybody will tell you, is huge. Sometimes, you know, <laughs> but sometimes the uh, for some people, the, the the opportunity to get on camera, even for 30 seconds, and bring them a message, is much better, much easier, much more effective than sitting and writing an essay. And if that's the case, then do it. I mean, it's no it's no more difficult than having somebody with an iPhone standing in front of you and doing it. And access, you know, the the barriers to entry to this world are zero, really zero. You mentioned earlier when you were talking about the difficult, the challenge of a CEO writing. If you're not a, if you're not a journalist, right, you're going to have a difficult time. Given how. <laughs> Uh, how the, the media landscape sort of disintegrated, right? And so now there's all these journalists that are looking for work, right, as, as the media thing goes. Do you see um, an industry or opportunities for like service bureaus to help these CEOs do this writing? Because I know, I mean, we are trying to develop an inbound marketing strategy, right? I want my team to be writing. My team are not writers. They can write, but they're not writers, right? So the a challenge is, well, how do I find people to help them write? And it just seems like there's an opportunity for, for for something like that to kind of merge together in some way. I just wonder what your thoughts are. Well, I would say people, I'm, 60, I'm 62 years old. Um, I would say people in my demographic and all the way down into their mid-40s, many of them have been thrown out of their jobs in the newspaper industry starting at the Ann Arbor News, you know, going to the New York Times and across this country, you know, tens of thousands of journalists have been thrown out of their jobs because as these news organizations struggle to survive, they cut from the top. There, there's no money, you know, for them to save by cutting a, a $22,000 a year intern. They cut, you know, from the top. And so there are a lot of people who are out of work. And I'm sure in that 
population, there's probably a subpopulation in which there are people who could come and sit at your organization and be effective from day one. You're, you're saying, how do you find those people? You know, my, my experience with peers is, you know, a lot of them come to me and say, well, how did you do this? How did you, you, you have to sort of fundamentally change your mindset if you're a journalist. And the mindset that I changed was, first I accept the, the, the critical notion that there are no jobs out there for me. There's, I, I couldn't get hired today anywhere in, in American journalism, nowhere. I mean, even if I came in and said I was work, willing to work virtually for free for a small town newspaper, they wouldn't hire me. But there's a lot of work out there. There's work, but there are no jobs. That's a little bit of a paradox. There's work, but there's no jobs. You would hire a journalist who would say, I, I'll, I'll come to work for you for 10 hours a week, but you're not going to put somebody on your payroll. Put the payroll as the, as, you know, as the house journalist. How does it work? You know, yeah, that, that's not going to happen. So, so, so you have to. So you really have to get journalists to understand. And I'm told, you know, maybe, you know, maybe they're, maybe the message I'm sending needs to be heard by about 10,000 people. I, I've told it to about a dozen of my friends who say, Oh, what are you going to? What am I going to do? What did you do? How did? You got to first accept the notion that there are no jobs, but there's work. Yeah. Well, we probably should. Uh, I got one. But, Time is, uh, is running out here, and uh, I, 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 we're all so fast today. Wants to say something. Roger? I want to, I want to ask a question. All right. <laughs> all right, so uh, a lot of journalists are on the payroll. There's a lot of bloggers working for news organizations. They don't have the same uh, freedom of press protections than the reporters had when they are on staff and just within the last 12 hours there's a local blogger for a major financial news outlet who is investigating a story and got threatened by whoever he was investigating that he could lose his job so he has no protection from the organization because he's a blogger he's not on staff so we're not getting, you know, we're, we're getting news suppressed that should be out there for the general public. It affects everybody. And I'm, I'm thinking this has probably already affected major news organizations where they got threatened for doing investigative journalism. Is that why we're not seeing as much investigative journalism? You know, I, I would I would take issue with about half the things you said, and I would agree with about half the things you said. Investigative journalism is nothing more than journalism at its very best. I I reject the notion that there's this special subcategory of journalism called investigative journalism. You know, where this sort of people you know report on what City Hall is doing, and then then there are the investigative journalists who sort of delve deeply into wrongdoing and misdeeds and so forth and win Pulitzer Prizes. I, I think that's a very false distinction. I think that um, good investigative journalism is nothing more than journalism at its very best, and it can be um, practiced by Ted Spin, okay, you know, most people have never heard of, but figured out how to bring some facts to light in the Manti Teo uh, case that nobody else had bothered looking for, okay? Not the New York Times, not the Washington Post, not Time Magazine, not anybody, okay? Who's dead spin? How much money do you think they have? So, yeah, I mean, there are people who always are gonna threaten intrepid journalists, but I wonder whether they're under more pressure if they're a staffer at the New York Times or whether they're independent. What about independent bloggers and journalists who make a name for themselves? You know, guys like Andrew Sullivan and people like that who just poke into things. And I, I think what's going to happen is that sometimes it's going to be difficult to establish yourself. But you're going to have to build your own reputation, your own credibility, your own track record of having looked into things. And then at that point, the, the, the Pentagon's willing to give you credentials. Because if the Pentagon just gave credentials to everybody who said, well, I'm a blogger and I want to cover national defense issues, you know, there'd be 10,000 people there. And that would be 
impossible. So this is a problem for major institutions. It's a problem for the for the car companies who who, who want to know. Some guy shows up and says, "I want to write a story about you know the new Ford Focus." Well, who are you? I mean, before they knew it was me of the Wall Street Journal. Now they they look at some guy that you know says, "Well." So he blogs and he blogs and he blogs and people read his stuff and then finally somebody in the PR department says, hey, can, you know, let him come to the press conference. He's, he knows what he's talking about. So it, you're right. I mean, it's the, sort of the normal channels of credibility and the normal channels of protection. They don't exist anymore, but they're going to be rebuilt. They will be rebuilt. And I'm not a bit worried about any of this. Not a bit. All right. I'll just And Jerome, uh, if people want to read your material, then where, where should they find it? Um, just put my name into Google. <laughs> That's a lot, a lot of stuff. It's a, it's a fascinating... Fortune.com, uh, you know. This, this, this gentleman is, is very well uh, regarded and has really thought through these issues. And I know I've had conversations with Patricia and with Laurel Champion of the uh, Ann Arbor uh, News, Bill Schmidt, who's a friend of mine, who's the... Uh, managing editor of the New York Times, and it's all very, very complicated. But it's exciting because it's kind of like the beginning of the uh, printing press. You know, we're just trying to figure all this out. And uh, Scott is doing work in education. Well, that's going to be the next area where I think all of a sudden jobs, as we knew them, uh, you know, people who are doing a lot of work that are really not doing a whole lot to keep up with things are going to be very surprised. And we see this sweeping from one industry to the other, so it's not just uh, press. A um, couple things coming up I just wanted to announce. Uh, we got a very interesting next few months. Uh, Dick Sarns and Steve Sarns are going to be talking about a uh, very exciting product, New Step, which is in the health and fitness field, and this is Dick's uh, second company. He's 85 and he's still operating as a CEO. Uh, very exciting guy, just was given an honorary doctorate at the University of Michigan. Then we have Kim Cameron, who is uh, the leader of the Positive Organizational Psychology Program at the University of Michigan Business School, and he will be speaking. And then we're very proud that Mary Sue Coleman uh, has uh, agreed to speak at the April event. So uh, right here, we're gonna, we may have to expand this a little bit, I don't know. So sign up early and, uh, and not often. So, uh, But uh, I'm really looking forward to the event. And Jerome, uh, thank you very much for coming. Feel free to hang out. Uh, where's Mandy? Mandy's not here right now. But again, we want to thank Mandy. Uh, people have asked about tipping. Uh, United Bank takes care of the food and they do provide a gratuity, but she's also very welcome to uh, you know receive any gratuities you might want to offer. And uh, we we have this food paid for, so please take it back to your workplace uh, or home or wherever. Uh, leave it in the trunk. It's nice and cold out. It'll stay good for whatever. So anything else? I think we should just wrap up, Marissa. I just have a book recommendation. Book recommendation. If, if anybody's interested in all this stuff, there's a book called Content Rules by Ann Hadley, What's and it called? Content Rules, it's like our- Content poem. Rules by Ann Hadley. It's like, we make all of our clients read it on my, it, it's great, it really gets into all the stuff you're talking about and answer a lot, of, pretty much any other questions that were mentioned here. It's a wonderful book, it's really readable. And I, I also want to announce one more thing, that on July 4th, there will be no talks anywhere, so don't sign up for anything and just enjoy the day, okay? <laughs> Roni, last word. Yeah, one of my friends who, um, you know, like me, is always looking for writing projects said, well, how much should I charge? I said, well, come up with an hourly rate. I said, what, what should I come up with? I said, start at $400 an hour, just keep going down until they say yes. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll see you all next month. Thanks to Stephanie, Mandy, and all the team here for putting this on. Nice to meet you. Yeah.